Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Today we're going to cover an introduction to FEA and SOLIDWORKS simulation. Um, if you're like most people, FEA isn't something, uh, sorry about that. If you're like most people, FEA isn't something you readily understand. Oftentimes it isn't something you're taught in high school or college. When I was in college, it was, wasn't covered in my undergraduate studies. It was reserved for the master's students and the PhDs. Thankfully, you don't need a master's degree to use SOLIDWORKS simulation products, but having a basic idea of how an FEA works can help you understand the results you get and make you into a better designer. Um, why is my slide not changing? There we go. If you are new to FEA, there are three basic things you need to understand to understand how an FEA works. You'll have to start with a good model, and once you've done that, you'll have to mesh it and understand what a mesh is. Once you have the mesh and the loads and the fixtures applied, you'll run the analysis. Now, most of us know there's some math going on in the background, but very few of us probably know just exactly what is happening in the background. So we'll take a brief look at a very simplified FEA to help you understand what's going on. Now, once you've gone through the math or let the analysis solve and you have the results, you'll need to understand what these colors mean and how they can help you to make a better model. With those three goals in mind, let's get started. So what exactly is a mesh? And the word refers to generally screens or nets or sometimes how gears fit together. But why do we call it a meshed model in SOLIDWORKS? Well, we call it that because the model, the software treats the model as a mesh. It doesn't view it as a solid, but as a series of dots connected with, um, well, for, the, for now, edges, springs later. So here's a very simple four-sided pyramid. It has four corners, six edges, four faces. Conveniently, it's a very simple element, such as a finite element. And what the software does is breaks your model into a whole bunch of these. Now, what we have here is an extremely coarse mesh in which each node is one of the corners of the triangle and each edge is one of the edges of the triangle. If we need more detail, which most of the time we do, we can add more nodes and more lines in between them. Now, it's important to notice, as I've hinted at before, that the analysis software doesn't actually recognize the faces, just the nodes and where the edges are. Now, finally, we can make it even more um, refined or a more dense mesh but that adds complication. Thankfully, most software today, most computer hardware can handle that on the level that most of us work on quite quickly. If you're doing an entire 747, it might not be the best. So I think it's all pretty straightforward with a simple shape like a pyramid, but what about a more complex shape? How does that hold up there? I actually think it makes a little more sense. Now we have what's a circle or a cylinder and it's broken into roughly eight pieces, which is really an octagon. But when we take more and more um, triangles, a denser and denser mesh, it looks more and more like the original model that we started with. So what makes a good mesh? It's important to note that the triangle shapes really do matter. I'm not going to get into the details quite yet, but the solution to an FEA is highly dependent on how each side of the triangle relates to the other sides. So it makes sense to have each side relatively the same size as the other sides. Remember that that mesh is an approximation of our initial model, so there will always be errors. But if we have a really long edge next to a really short edge, like on the right, we might have three or 4% margin of error in one of those edges but the smaller one is only three or 4% the length of the other one. So our numbers basically become junk because one of them falls within the margin of error or the other. Hopefully from that little uh, interlude into meshes, you can understand the difference and see why the mesh on the right is better than the one on the left. We've now broken our model into a bunch of little triangles to mesh it and tried to keep them relatively equal sized, but why? Well, the solution, according to Homer, is math. 
Before we get into the FEA, there are a couple of values we'll need to understand. The first is the modulus elasticity, and it's a fancy name for the ratio between how much pressure is applied and how much a bit of material stretches or compresses. The higher the modulus of elasticity, or the more pressure required for a given stretch or squish. Now, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as Young's modulus. Thomas Young here gets the credit, even though his work came 25 years after Euler's work on similar stuff. But we digress. Someday I want my own modulus. So let's take a look at a spring slide, or a slide showing a very simple spring. This is a linear spring. It's about as simple as they come. You're probably familiar with the equation F is equal to Kx. It's pretty simple, pretty easy conceptually. Um, I think you cover it in like sixth grade science. When a pressure is applied to a new to a material, the new length is a function of the stiffness, which is Young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity, and the pr the pressure in the beginning length. So with the values we have here, the stress, which is our, like our force, and E. Um, the elastic modulus, we can tell how L2 is going to relate to L1. So let's look at something slightly more complicated. Imagine this is a plate. On the right-hand side, it's fixed. On the left-hand side, we apply a load. Oops. And, and as you'd expect, it stretches a little bit. Now, each one of those springs, we knew the initial length, and we can measure the additional length. So if we set it up into a little series of equations here, we have obviously one and one, two and two, and the different colors. These all relate to each other. Well, let me just start over here. Thankfully, this isn't a math lesson, because even the math on just three or four of these nodes is more math than I really want to get into right now or care to do anyway. But it suffices to say that the change in length of each of these springs is dependent on the lengths and stiffnesses of both the first spring and all the other springs it's connected to, along with the force or pressure applied to it. While, again, we could do all this math by hand, it makes sense to just leave this to an FEA solver. That's why people do it. It's easier, it's faster. And the FEA solver will convert all these springs into equations and arrange them into a matrix. And in the background, it's going to work out a solution. Today, we're going to take the blue pill, which means the story ends here. We leave the math in the matrix and we wake up in bed deciding what we want to believe or not believe. So we woke up in bed choosing to believe that the image we get from SOLIDWORKS has something to do with reality. Most times when we're running analysis, we want to know if the part in question is going to fail. And then the next question we ask instantly is, well, how close is it to failure? Are we really close and only going to fail? Are we really far away? and past failure? Are we just over the failure point? The second value that we'll need, we talked about the elastic modulus, to get a useful information out of FEA is the yield strength. At what stress will the material permanently change shape so it doesn't spring back anymore like a rubber band? That's the yield stress. And for most designs, you want to keep the stress well below the yield stress. A general rule of thumb is half the yield stress for everyday engineering. Aerospace, you're much closer, but you do a lot more testing because of the you can't afford the extra weight. You don't want a bow to lose its shape. You want it to stay in that elastic area below the yield strength when you pull it back to shoot an arrow. It can bend a lot, but it needs to come back to its regular shape. Otherwise, it isn't much of a bow or very good at shooting an arrow. And once something stretches beyond the point that it won't come back to its original shape, it's said to have yielded. So for most designs, yielding is considered a failure, and it's advisable to stay away from it. Everything has a natural frequency. To put it more simply, everything's going to sway or move back and forth when it's excited. The A string on a violin, when you pluck it, if it's in tune, will vibrate at 440 times per second. This little bracket here, I didn't record what the frequency is, but it's going to have a mode shape anyway. At a certain frequency, it's going to want to ring back and forth that way. If you hit it with a hammer, that's the way it's going to vibrate when it rings. Second mode shape, it's going to go left to right. Most of us have heard that you can break a wine glass with just sound. 
I don't know if the sound's going to come through on this video. I think it will, but this kid did it. As a as a general rule, the resonant frequency of a structure should be higher than any vibrations we'll see. If you're designing a glass, ideally you'd want it above the to have a natural frequency above the sounds that it's going to hear regularly. A vibration study is going to show what frequency a part vibrates at so that a designer can make sure there are no natural frequencies being inputted into the system that will be regularly accounted. So for example, if I'm designing a bracket and it has a resonance frequency of 60 hertz, that's probably not a good idea if I'm going to put it on an electric motor which is running at 3600 RPM. 3600 RPM divided by 60 seconds in a minute gives you 60 hertz. So that bracket's going to have some issues, which we'll talk about in our next slide here. So fatigue. We've talked about failure from an initial loading, like pulling it back a too far and it doesn't come back to its original shape. But parts also fail over time, and that's referred to as fatigue. Uh, it's easiest to think of this, for me at least, is what happens when I work a paper clip or a coat hanger back and forth. At first it bends, and then it bends some more, and then it bends some more, but eventually a crack forms, and it no longer bends, it just cracks in two. This can happen because of repeated loading, such as the paper clip going back and forth, or by vibrational loading, such as the motor exciting the bracket. Fortunately, this type of failure can be predicted for most materials when we know the stress and the number of cycles from that stress. I've used a fatigue study here in SOLIDWORKS, which combines the known stress and the known SN, or stress to number of cycles curve, to estimate how many cycles of a given load this part can withstand. And if you notice, there's a little bit of an area around the rivet hole in the middle of the part that's going to fail. I doubt it's going to be at 28,298.5 cycles, but somewhere in the 28,000 range. So if I were designing this bracket knowing that it's going to be used for 30 years and there's a thousand cycles it sees a year, I would say it's not strong enough to last for 30 years. Now, if it was only designed to last for five years at a thousand cycles, I'd feel like this was probably a pretty good design. Another failure mode we've talked about two already. The third is buckling. And this isn't so much a material failure as a geometry failure. On the left, you can see a long slender, slender rod. It looks like the force would continue straight through it. But because of the longness and slenderness, that shape turns more into a bow than a column or a pillar. And the stress develops not equally among every element or every um, atom or molecule in the structure, but it concentrates in the center. And when this breaks, it happens rather catastrophically. So, by convention, we use a load factor to determine if this part is going to break in a buckling failure. This is a separate study within SOLIDWORKS. But one is where the magic happens. So anything above a load factor of one, it's not going to buckle at a load factor of one, it's like a pencil balancing on its sharpened point, not a good idea. And below that, we know it's going to fail for sure. And then moving on to another failure mode, which is deformation. So once we know that we're into yield, we might want to know what's going to happen. And SOLIDWORKS can do that through a nonlinear study. The load is applied. We go past the rubber band part, remove the load, and you see it's not the shape it once was. This can be, this part takes quite, quite a set, but I can live with it. It's not a catastrophic failure. The customer might need to buy a new part, but it hasn't broken and fallen off. If you need to know what something looks like once it's deformed, or if it has exceeded the yield strength, a nonlinear simulation is what you'll need. This is used to if you need to simulate what happens to a material after it's been overloaded, or if you need to bend it into shape, into the shape that you want as part of the manufacturing process, such as a sheet metal bend or a forming operation or bending a pipe to make a dune buggy. Uh, 
You've now seen how a mesh relates to reality, some of the math going on in the background of an FEA, and perhaps how you can use an FEA to give guidance to a design. It's always beneficial to do as much simulation as possible before you start a production intent design. Production intent design, just like it's better to do testing on a simple prototype early on than on a finished product later. It's best to keep the backtrack into a minimum. So if you haven't already, I suggest you give our SOLIDWORKS simulation package a try.